Hi, I'm Dr. Fersini Boutsikas and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Ghent. My area of specialization is in ancient Greek religion. So today's lecture is going to be on the study of ancient Greek religion. I hope to give you a brief overview of three areas where the study of ancient religion can enhance our understanding of ancient societies. This lecture is broken down into three sections. The first one will discuss the relationships between myth and religion. The second part focuses on examples of an, the application of modern technology in archaeological research and how modern technology can enhance our understanding of ancient religious experience. And then the final part of the lecture will give you a couple of examples of how religion permeated the transition of teenagers to becoming full citizens in ancient Sparta and Athens. What are the reasons that led people to create myths? Myths, like religion, assisted in understanding big and unexplained events. So people created a world that encompassed their own with what they knew from their experience in the real world. And they associated all the feared elements of the larger world with familiar creatures. Myth was also used to commemorate stories of the heroic past, which enforced a group's ethnic, religious, and local identity and showed their close relationship with certain gods. Myth evolves alongside the development of knowledge of the surrounding world, but it has no trouble to narrate stories which violate every natural law. For example, Daphne, as she runs away from Apollo, turns into a tree, Halcyon turns into a bird, and a newborn Hercules kills two large snakes. Even when describing natural phenomena that have a natural cause, myth transforms them to titanic personalities. So thunder falls not according to the natural laws, but following Zeus's will. One of the main concerns of humanity has been how we came to be. Ancient societies created a group of myths called creation myths, which address this question. Most Greek and Roman myths reflect a preoccupation with creation, with the, na the nature of the gods and humans, the afterlife, and other spiritual concerns. These creation stories and conceptions of divinity were considered to be true and provided the basis for devout religious belief. So, for example, the myths of the battle between the Titans and the Olympians, or the battle of the giants and the Olympians, narrate major climatic changes and natural disasters which resulted in shaping the world as we know it. Once the Olympians prevail, the cosmic balance returns and now humans are allowed to prosper. These myths also explain why, for example, there are earthquakes, hurricanes, floods and so on. The ancients did not know about the laws of nature and physics that govern such events, like, for example, the movement of tectonic plates. So in order to deal with these occurrences, they explained them as divine acts. If science had not been able to give us answers about why earthquakes happen, for example, we would still today believe that they were caused by divine powers. So myth is a mode of human thought. It has its own logic. It gives report on the sacred origins of the world, and of the cultural group which created it by narrating the events that took place in primordial times. This means that myth has an ideological content. So the question remains, now that we know a little bit more about how the world operates, why do we still study ancient myths? The answer is relatively easy. It's because ancient myths allow us to understand better how these people understood the world around them and what they thought their place in the world was. Myth allows us to see how certain people who are ambitious use mythology and religion in order to gain more power. And I will show you an example of that in a minute. When we study myths, be they religious or not, we have to think about the contrast between myth and reality. And besides the stories about the gods, Myths also narrate stories about extraordinary men who did extraordinary things. So, for example, 150 years ago, almost, um, Heinrich Schliemann identified a city in Turkey which 
was in the location that we would expect to find Troy, leading all the archaeologists to agree that Troy did exist. Now, we know the location of Troy. We have also identified the location of Sparta and Mycenae. So if Sparta, Mycenae and Troy really did exist, does that mean that Menelaus and Agamemnon and Helen also existed? And if we accept that, what stops us from accepting the fact that, for example, Zeus and Athena or Oedipus and Jocasta existed? And what if there really was a Helen who ran off with a good-looking prince and her husband went after her and there was a major punch-up between the Greeks and the Trojans? Maybe some of the myths we know contain an element of truth. Is myth just a story? Not necessarily. It can contain some factual historical evidence, but what if you do not believe in these gods? What can you take from these texts? The purpose of stories and myths is to communicate important ideas, to set a good example, for instance, of the way we should behave to give moral messages about what is acceptable and appropriate behavior. In some, myths set the example of how a community should live, i.e. not killing, not committing adultery, not stealing, and so on. So the message is more important than the story. The messages of religious texts have many similarities to myth. The difference is that religious texts are well organized in order to convey messages, whereas in myth, uh, a story can arise as and when needed in order to explain certain phenomena or to satisfy the needs of the community which created it. And we may never be able to know how much of these stories was true, but what we can do is ask, what did these stories intend to account for? So let me give you that example that I mentioned before about one function of myth. In 331 BC, the people of ancient Egypt welcome a 24-year-old Greek military invader at Memphis, where in the shadows of the pyramids, the Egyptian priest crowned him with the great double crown of the pharaohs. His coronation was followed by his visit to the most sacred Egyptian oracle in the oasis of Siwa, where he was declared and greeted as the son of the chief god Ammon. His conquest of Egypt had just freed the Egyptians from 100 years of brutal oppression at the hands of the Persian Empire, and Alexander was thus seen by the Egyptians as their savior. Alexander's pronunciation as the son of God was something that he had sought for and had cultivated throughout his life. A myth had been constructed around his myth. Apparently, he was conceived in a brilliant light. His mother was telling him that a lightning bolt lit up the room where she was, striking deep into her womb, warming but not harming her. She understood that what had happened, she had been impregnated by none other than the king of the gods, Zeus, who was known to signify his presence with lightning bolts. Clearly, Zeus had chosen her to bring his child in the world. Thus Alexander was the son of Zeus. His mother's family history traced its roots back to Achilles. And through the story with Zeus that I've just mentioned, Alexander acquired also another not to be sniffed at distant relative, Hercules. He believed his mother's story and saw himself as both a god and a man. Alexander even wrote to the Greek states, asking each of them to grant him the honors due to a divinity. The reasons why Alexander would want to be thought of as the son of Zeus are quite obvious. It increased his power, reputation, fame, and posterity. This ancestry matched his actions and impact in the world. There is no doubt that Alexander was unmatched. Already by the age of 16, he had won his first battle and had named his first city. By the age of 20, he was crowned king of Macedon. In his 13-year campaign until his death at the age of 33, he conquered most or all of modern Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan.
it was the single most important event in history between the Bronze Age and the coming of Rome. Never had there been anyone like him before, and being proclaimed God during his lifetime was equally unique. So when the Egyptian priests addressed him as the son of Ammon, which in Greek was translated to son of Zeus, they had basically confirmed what many had long suspected. Alexander was really divine. Whether by accident or design, he was acclaimed as God on earth. And Alexander managed his own image with care. His tousled hair springs from the forehead in two arcs, which the Greeks called anastole. Now the Greeks associated such hair with the lion's mane. On his coins, Alexander printed the head of Hercules wearing the lion's skin and the throne of Zeus on the reverse, stating explicitly his family relations. So the king is like a lion, he is the son of Zeus. It is all embedded in the messages carried by the imagery. These images imply that king is one who is leonine, who is forever young, like an immortal, and mythology is the medium for conveying these messages and importantly, the medium for royal propaganda. And this is a pattern that is followed after Alexander by Roman emperors. So myth is not always linked with religion, but religion is always associated with myth. And every single religious area or sanctuary that we have has a foundation myth behind it. These are stories that basically narrate how the cult came to be in that specific location, why a certain god is associated with that religious space, and how certain cults were being performed in that area. These myths also tell us a lot about ancient religious experience in these areas. So this brings us to the second part of the lecture, which is going to be about using modern technology in order to understand better this ancient religious experience in religious spaces. One such sanctuary was that of Apollo Epicurus at Basse. The site is located on the Arcadian mountains and the temple was probably built by Ictinus in the mid fifth century BC. Now Ictinus is also the architect of the Athenian Acropolis. The sanctuary is dedicated to Apollo Epicurus Apollo the helper, uh, but Apollo is also the god of light in ancient Greece. The temple to Apollo Epicurus at Basse is a very innovative temple for a number of reasons. It has a long and narrow plan which would have made the interior rather dark, but this is balanced by having an east entrance as a side entrance. Also, the interior columns of the temple are not freestanding as you can see on the plan, instead they project towards the wall and the positioning of the last pair of interior columns is not placed perpendicular to the wall as the others but at an angle. This effect directed the light entering from the east entrance towards the center of the structure. Also this is the first temple to incorporate all three architectural orders. It has a Doric exterior which you see on the screen and then in the reconstruction of the interior you see the Ionic order, and also a single Corinthian column in the interior at the place where usually the god's cult statue stood. Now in 1980, the temple was covered with a canopy in order to protect it from weathering as its condition had deteriorated due to the extreme weather conditions varying from heavy snow in the winter to scorching heat in the summer. There is also another problem with this temple though. Because it is located in an area of seismic activity, the ancient Greeks applied an anti-seismic method. They inserted a layer of clay directly under the temple's foundations because clay is a more elastic material to stone, so it functions like a cushion or suspension, if you like, in absorbing some of the shaking caused by the earthquakes. This method has obviously been effective, the temple stands, but the movement of the clay bed has caused the temple's floor to shift, meaning that some of the columns are now tilted. In addition, 2,500 years after its construction, part of the clay layer has also receded, causing the temple floor to sink. So what remains of the temple is a shadow of what it once was, 
And since it is still covered by the canopy, it is no longer possible to study it in its natural setting. So what I have done is use virtual reality software to create a model of the temple and its landscape through the use of software developed for computer games. Having fully reconstructed the temple, now I can put on my VR headset, oh, sorry, wrong headset, there we are, and walk inside the temple as it was in the fifth century BC. And here are some things that I've discovered just a few months ago. This is the view of the innermost part of the temple behind the Corinthian column, where probably the cult statue was placed. And what becomes apparent is that a spectacular effect was created when in midsummer, towards the end of June, the rising sun would shine on the cult statue inside the temple, which is the effect that you see on the screen. As I said before, Apollo was the Greek god of light, so this matches Apollo's attributes. The equinoxes mark the time when the days become longer or shorter. The timing and the visual effect of the rising sun illuminating the statue of the god of light would have been quite impressive for the ancients. Now, the sunbeam entered the temple's east entrance at sunrise on the spring equinox. It traced a path in the temple's abiton for three hours. The sunbeam would be visible also if standing directly outside the east entrance, if standing inside the temple, and also from the temple's main entrance. So a VR model is the only avenue we have to determine rather than speculate the light effect of the sunrise in the temple. Even if the canopy was not covering the temple, it would have been impossible to observe this because the door opening has not survived intact and obviously the sun's position has also moved since 500 BC. In addition to that, what this model enables us to do is to recreate the experience of what the temple was like in its natural setting. So the study of ancient religious architecture can offer us a vast number of avenues to explore, not always connected to the religious rituals performed at the site. So for example, we can study the myths that are narrated in the sculptural decoration of a temple and the messages that the creators of these temples wanted to pass to visitors, the choice of materials and the display of wealth, the skill of the sculptors and many more. So Greek rituals differ vastly in the common all sizes depending on the god that they were dedicated to or the purpose of the ritual. So this takes us to the next part of the lecture, which is going to be on a type of rituals you may have never heard of before, but despite them being celebrated still today. These are called initiation rituals or rites of passage. These are rituals that mark the transition of an individual from one stage of life to another. In modern and ancient societies, there were, are, various types of such rituals. The most common are birth rituals, wedding rituals, or burial rites, marking the most significant transitions in our existence. But these are not the only ones. The rites of passage we will learn about today are those that ancient Greek boys and girls near your age would be participating in. These rites mark the coming of age. The transition from being an adolescent or a child to becoming an adult member of the society. Because its gender had a different function in ancient societies, rites of passage differed accordingly to reflect this with the genders being strictly segregated. But every rite of passage has three stages. Separation, liminality, which involves the individual being marginalized, and reintegration into society with an enhanced status. Each stage, is marked with different procedures and rituals. For example, adolescents receive instruction in adult activities, such as hunting for boys, weaving and corn grinding for girls. Rituals introduce the individuals to tribal traditions, such as customary songs and dances, as well as being exposed to sexuality and violence. And this served as an introduction to the new life and the ritualistic death of the old self. Now, during these rituals, the adolescents 
were introduced to the moral laws and values of the society and were trained accordingly as they would have to abide by them from now on. So these rituals have specific aims. One of them is to place the adolescents under the protection of the gods for the duration of adulthood. Initiation rituals were a way of confirming that the coming of age was approved by the gods and fate. Also, another aim is to introduce the individuals to the new status and what that entailed and required. The rituals educate adolescents on their obligations towards the society and the gods, and male rites of passage were designed to introduce boys to the community at large as they would eventually have to take part in political decisions through voting. Female transition is marked by the ability of the girls to become mothers and wives, and in most cities, women would not have civic and public roles. So let's start with the boys, and in particular Spartan boys. The agogi was an 11-year-long initiatory process for Spartan boys. It formed the boys' education with the main aim to build the perfect soldier and citizen and to instill loyalty and obedience to the state. Sparta was a strictly military society. The only career for a young, healthy Spartan man was to become a soldier, and becoming one required very strict and painful training. For the Spartans, being a soldier and dying for Sparta was the utmost honor. The agogi prepared them for becoming full citizens of Sparta. So, at the age of seven, the boys were taken from the families and began their lengthy state-run citizen training. The agogi was broken down into two stages based on the boy's age. Pedes, from seven to 12, and Pediski from 13 to 18. The boys were allocated in annual age classes organized in packs and herds, and they were placed under the supervision of tutors responsible for their upbringing. They studied reading, uh, writing, physical exercise, music, and dancing. The training's predominant focus was on endurance in order to build the strength a Spartan soldier required to be the best warrior. During this process, boys were continuously monitored. They were encouraged to break the exclusive ties with the natal families and to consider all Spartans of the father's age as their possible parents. During these years, the boys played cult games and fought battles among themselves while under the protection of Artemis Orthea, whose temple was central to Spartan education for both boys and girls. The status of the boys during this year was liminal, as they were excluded from society. This liminal status was also reflected in that they were exempt from the jurisdiction of most civic magistrates. They were subjected to a variety of challenges, such as encouraged to steal and to commit other antisocial acts necessary for their survival. If caught during this act, they were not punished for committing it, but for being caught, because as a warrior, if one was caught, he would have failed in his task or been killed. This is also reflected in Xenophon's quote that you see on the screen. There were no excuses, no weakness was allowed, so this process ensured that only the strongest made it through. After the age of 12, the agogi got much tougher. At 18, when the agogi ended, they entered national service. Further initiation took place upon completing the agogi. A process of selection was operated to single out those Spartans who were destined for the highest positions of adult Spartan life, such as membership of the elite royal bodyguard, holding the top military offices, and eventually election to the Council of Elders. These elite Spartans were called Hibondes until the age of 30 when they became full adult citizens. A number of young men selected from the Hibontes formed what was known as the Cryptia, Secret Operations Executive, an initiation for elite students. They transversed the countryside, concealing themselves by day for a month. Plato and Plutarch presented as a lengthy test of individual endurance without equipment in winter, sent barefoot into the wilderness. The Cryptia, a headhunting ritual, 
provided initiation into adulthood, after which all members of each age class married simultaneously. In old age, some of these individuals obtained considerable political power through membership of the Council of Elders. For some of the Spartan boys, this lengthy initiatory process did not end until the age of 30. Through the agogi, which was unique to Sparta, Spartans were able to define themselves in contrast to other Greek cities and the Romans. In addition, because the boys spent so many years in each other's company, they formed putative types of kinship. Through the agogi, the Spartans created powerful reenactments of an idealized cultural legacy and claimed themselves a lasting place in Greek culture, projecting an image of Sparta that has endured for more than two millennia. On the other hand, age class control of marriage along with segregation of the sexes until the age of 30, probably had important demographic consequences linked to Sparta's manpower problems. No formal series of initiations for girls exist as they didn't experience social transformation until marriage, which formed the main rite of passage for women. The small number of female rites of passage targeted only at a, at a select group of girls suggests that the transition to womanhood was negotiated primarily in the home rather than the wider society. This transition was marked individually by dedications as private acts rather than public group rituals for girls. Dedications would be made to specific deities on attaining puberty, on undergoing marriage, and on giving birth. This involved the dedication of toys, and child dispossessions, locks of hairs, belts, and so on. Only a small and select number of girls were given the temporary privilege of being in the service of a deity for a year. In Athens, a few select young Athenian girls aged around 11 and 13 were chosen to act as the maidens of Athena. They were called Arephori and they lived on the Acropolis for a year. 33 kilometers southeast of Athens, a select number of girls aged between 7 and 13 served as little priestesses of Artemis for a year at her sanctuary at Broron. The name, as bears of Artemis, linked myths involving real bears with Artemis in that location. And finally, in Sparta, we have girls of similar age called maidens of Artemis performing rituals at the sanctuary of Artemis Althea. The time of the girl's service to the goddess marked the beginning of the transition from being a girl to becoming a woman, which was completed at marriage. The rituals performed by these prepubescent girls were in hope that the goddesses would grant them successful childbirth later in their lives. So overall, in terms of the rites of passage, they are aimed at distinguishing and marking life transitions. Through the pledging of the new members, they also demonstrate commitment to the state and respect to its laws and morals. They achieve the education of the young generation as controlled by the state. Today, although some initiations are still associated with religion, for example, the mitzvah or the first Holy Communion, they are in the majority social than religious. For example, proms, the quinceañera, high school graduations, or more focused initiations marking membership to specific groups like university fraternities and sororities, which teach new members the significance behind the group's symbols, mottos, and beliefs. Studying the religious beliefs of a society lets us into part of ancient life as religion and mythology permeated all aspects of life. Religion was part of the people's education, cosmovision, part of their understanding of the natural environment and climate, part of their history. It governed political power and political system, national identity, but was also essential in the core of every society, the ancient family. So through the study of religion and uses of modern technology, we can achieve a better understanding of ancient society. So religion played a role in aesthetics, monumental architecture and art. It even determined people's health and travel plans. 
But you can learn more about that if you join us at Kent. Thank you for listening.